uh, but it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I'll tell you that. So let's like uh, briefly about me. I've been focused on kind of no code security um, and how do you help business users build secure applications for a few years now. I started a company that's focused on this space. Uh, we've been around for almost four year, uh, three years now called Zenity. I lead a, a NoWasp project dedicated to low code, no code. And uh, there are probably a couple of people in the audience right now that are part of this project. So please do uh, reach, the, reach, out, uh, reach out to them afterwards for, for questions. Um, and I'm trying to share as much as I can about this space because uh, I, th I feel like we have a really big opportunity at, at our hands here. So here's like in a nutshell what we're going to do today. We're going to start by just making sure we're all on the same page on what what no code actually means, or what do I mean when I say no code. We're going to move, th then we're going to move to the shift to the attacker's perspective, and I'm going to share concrete examples of attacks we've observed in the wild, uh, where attackers have leveraged no code for their own purposes. That includes living off the land, uh, phishing attacks, and per persistency, and much more depends on time. Uh, and of course, we're going to finish it off with, uh, with helpful tips on how to defend your organization um, uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you get back to office. So let's start off with, uh, with no code. Um, this, is the, this number right now, 5 million, is the number of .NET developers, according to Microsoft, the number of active .NET developers today. So 5 million C Sharp developers active right now. Now, with this number as a reference, think about how many developers are there out there that are building local no-code apps. Like just have a, have a number in your head. And so because we're comparing, because this is the, the Microsoft ecosystem, let's compare the number of .NET developers with the number of developers that are using the Microsoft Power Platform ecosystem to build applications. I've actually gone through their earning reports and weeded out the numbers. And as you can see here, today there are almost, or according to this uh, regression, there are 8 million active Power Platform developers today. 8 million Power Platform developers, 5 million um, .NET developers. Now, these numbers are, as you can see, like the last number that, they actually, that I actually got a quote on was 7 million. But still, like, just think about how much we're investing in those professional developers uh, versus business developers. So this is why this is important. And thinking about, like, the one thing that is important about these developers is, like, where do they work? <laughs> they work for you, right? They work for the top uh, organizations in the world because those are the organizations that are using the Microsoft suite. And so here's an example from one, one organization, one Fortune 100 organization, on the number of applications that they, they've seen created with no code uh, 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 throughout the years. And you can see just how fast this thing, this thing grows. These are actually num these are these are real numbers from a real company, uh, and they are actually not just not that wild. There are other companies that have many more, um, and it shows like uh, of course not all of these applications are huge applications. Some of them are very small. Some of them are kind of a uh, if this and that rule. But still, they are uh, they, they are uh, applications with identity with access to data. So uh, it's important for us to to understand just that the magnitude of this thing. And right now, in the last few months, this thing have, has been happening, where now we are seeing in every major local local platform, we are seeing AI being introduced as a way to lower the bar even more, to more easily create applications, and more than that, to create applications that are more complex. So what you're seeing right now on screen is a, an experience in the office suite where you talk to the chat, to the AI, and it will generate an application for you. This application ends up, once you're done with the chat, this application has created a table in a, in a managed SQL server. It has exposed an endpoint uh, inside of your organization. The, the application is already live. It's already in production. So you understand the magnitude of this. And of course, it also means that you can build more complex applications very easily. And so, and, and this is not just a Microsoft thing. This is happening across, uh, across the industry because AI and no code are, are very much uh, interconnected in the way that uh, when you think about building Gen AI application, it's all about these kind of building blocks that you need to plug in together. And so right now, 
people have the ability across the organization to just spell out the application that they would like built to have built and the AI will build it for them. And of course, like assuming that AI would build a secure application is, is, is kind of a, a difficult assumption to make. Um, this is not new. This has been happening for a long time now. And there, are, there have been many uh, cases, like many technologies that have come that have come through that have enabled people to do more, to accomplish more with their digital workspaces. Excel comes to mind as one clear example of a software that enabled people to do, to do more, that empowered them uh, to be able to, to do more than they were able to do before. Uh, and right now with Loco no Nocode and Gen AI, these things are, this is, this is like the next evolution, but it's really taking on quickly. Uh, and, and one important thing to note is that this is all of our, this this problem or, or this space is relevant to all of us because you don't really get to make the decision whether you have no code in your organization or not. It's already there. If you're using any one of these platforms on screen and uh, most of the SaaS vendors out there have kind of integrated no code directly into their platform. And so you don't get the choice. If you're using Microsoft, ServiceNow, Salesforce, you already have a low-code, no-code platform in your organization, and they have been enabling your business users to build secure to build applications, which they try to make secure, um, on top of business data that's already there. All right. So a quick recap uh, on on kind of on no-code. We know that no-code is available in every major organization. We know that his, it has the access to both business data and power, and it also powers business uh, uh, processes by design. Like this is. This is part of the of your business ecosystem. Uh, of course, because this runs on this is b based on SaaS, most of it will run on somebody else's infra. Uh, admittedly, there are some platforms that would allow you to run to run your own, but that's not the norm. Uh, and the, those applications can be built by anyone between a professional developer and a citizen developer, which means like everyone in your organization. Um, and so, and even with professional developers, you'll find that the controls are really not there. But um, that's kind of a recap up until now to make sure that we're all on the same on the same page of what of what no code is. Now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to share a few attacks that we've seen in the wild. And also for each one of the attacks, I'm going to recreate it together with you here. Um, and at the end, you'll you'll see that all of this is wrapped in a tool that you'll be able to uh, to access by the end of this talk. Uh, by the way, everything that you're seeing on screen, including the uh, the deck and the uh, 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 and the source cont uh, and the source is already published. You'll see links uh, in a moment. All right. So the first thing I wanna like before I I, I we we talk about this attack, we need to figure out like we need to have a clear example of how a, lo a low code application looks like. So uh, here's a quick little demo. This is a, a silly example where uh, there's, there's the, this annoying thing in Slack where when somebody mentions me in a public channel, I'm expected to reply quickly because other, people's are, uh, other people are watching. And so I'm building here a quick application where every time they subscribe to a notification that I, I get, uh, that somebody mentions me in a public channel, it's going to replace my status as if I'm on a call. So people will know that uh, they d that uh, I'm unavailable right now, and they will leave me alone. Uh, and then five minutes later, it's going to switch off to uh, to, uh, to to a regular uh, kind of profile uh, to make sure that nobody gets suspicious. Now, this is a silly example, but the important thing here is just to figure out how a how easy it is to create this application. You're seeing it on screen right now. But b this is a this is a pretty significant piece of application, right? It, uh, it, uh, it has to authenticate to Slack. It has to maintain secrets that would somehow allow it to authenticate to Slack. Note that I'm not providing secrets in any, in any part right here in, the talk, in, 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 this, in building this app. It needs to wait for five minutes, so there's a state somewhere. It runs, kind of, it, 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 it runs on, on somebody else's cloud. I can share this application. And so this is a significant piece of software that I get to build very quickly. And the number one thing that's important for us to figure out about this app is the identity. How is it connected to Slack? And so if you think, when you think about, uh, when, when you build an application, this is, I'm showing you an example for Zapier, but this is true for almost any no-code platform. Um, if you think about like allowing business users to build applications, the number one thing that would stop them from building applications is uh, permissions, right? If they would need to ask for a service account every time they uh, wanted to 
uh, uh, to create an application that you would never see the chart that I showed you earlier with the number of applications that get developed. And so how exactly does this happen? This happens by, uh, so the, the way that platforms circumvent this problem is that they allow users to basically uh, record their refresh token, their OAuth refresh token, and then share it with others. You're seeing it on screen. So when you create, when you uh, plug in Zapier, for example, to your Slack account, you're seeing the normal OAuth flow here where uh, uh, you are, you're allowing Zapier to operate on your behalf. And then there is something called a connection that get, gets created, which is essentially just a wrapper around credentials. But the important thing is that, is that you get this share button, this share button on top of the connection that allows you to share your identity with others. Now, note that this is not sharing, like, like this is not providing uh, access uh, uh, the way that OAuth was intended. This is just copying and allowing somebody else to use your refresh token, which means that there is no way to distinguish the application when, some, when one user uses it or another user uses it. Everybody's using the same token. Behind the scene, the way that this works is that there are mechanisms where the application gets uh, is, is sending requests to uh, to the API of its of its choice, and the platform is just replacing the tokens, uh, just making sure that when the uh, Power Automate or Zapier or any other automation platforms reaches out to Slack on your behalf, then even though the automation itself doesn't have access to your token, it's it, the token gets stored uh, uh, on a proxy. Uh, between those two two points, and it just and the token just gets injected uh, between those two points. This means that uh, every user of the application, every user of the connection uh, of the uh, of the automation, would use the same credentials through this gateway. They would not have direct access to the credential. They they can't like fetch out, or in most cases, they can't fetch out the token. However, they are free to use it, right? And so when you uh, when you look at these uh, at these uh, platforms, because people are widely using them, you're seeing on screen uh, people are kind of creating a whole bunch of things with them, and you're seeing on screen a bunch of popular examples that I just took off uh, marketplaces for many of the different vendors. The important thing that uh, uh, for what you're seeing on screen here to note is actually the logos, because they indicate that these platforms are actually connected on your behalf across your organization. They're connected to G Suite, they're connected to Office, they can be connected anywhere, including on-prem and, uh, and to your cloud, which means that behind every one of these logos, there's access to, access to data. By the way, that doesn't have to be read-only access, that could very easily be full access, full control. And the worst thing is that most of these platforms have some way uh, to share this connection, have this way to share these connections, and so pretty soon you end up with a whole bunch of connections. And you're seeing this example on screen where a bunch of connections were created because they just created a bunch of applications that were kind of popular in my organization. And one of the things that you'll see in most of these platforms is a way to collaborate, right? This is a, this is these platforms are allowing productivity within your, within your environment, and so there's this notion of a default environment. And the default environment is a wave, is the, it's like, it's like the place where you log in, everybody has, creden uh, has uh, permissions to uh, build uh, things there by default. And in this default environment, you will typically find a, a large pile of connections that are just waiting around for anybody to use them. You, like you, re you realize what this means. This is just like a, a bag of, con uh, of credentials that are waiting for everybody, for anybody to, to join in. And the only thing that you need in order to uh, to get into that uh, to this pile of gold is just a, a is a single user inside of an organization. And uh, of course, in a large enterprise, uh, we need to operate under the assumption that one t that at least one user would eventually. Uh, uh, be attacked, like uh, be, be compromised, right? Uh, especially when you when you uh, consider that most of these platforms allow vendors and guests to have access to your platform as well. And so once you're in, you are able to uh, to quickly just pick up those credentials and reuse them for 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 yourself. And, and we'll show that we'll see that in a moment. Um, what can you do with these connections? So you can do uh, basically everything that you can do with the, with the credentials behind them. And in most cases, these are full blown, this is full blown access to those, uh, uh, to those underlying uh, data stores or services. And so here's one example, you can build a ransomware directly using those connections. So in this uh, Power Automate uh, flow here, I'm uh, 
listing out all of the folders in a specific SharePoint site, and then I'm just encrypting, uh, I'm encrypting every file with the uh, encryption function that is provided by the platform, because there are valid use cases to provide an encryption function. Of, co <laughs> of course, that, that could also use, be used for malicious purposes. And so that's one way to do it. You can, you can of course, as you can see on the right side, there's a whole bunch of connectors here. So you can do that well across the enterprise, not just in, in, in SharePoint. Um, one of the things that might be surprising here uh, is that you can also use this to bypass your uh, network uh, mechanisms, your, your DLP mechanisms. Because like, this is kind of the latest innovation in exfiltrating email. So users have uh, forever been trying to uh, move data to their personal accounts because uh, most people would rather read their uh, corporate, or a lot of people would rather read their corporate email or have their personal and corporate calendar uh, synced with each other. Uh, of course, this could very easily lead to, uh, data ex to data leakage from your organization. And so we have different mechanisms to try to stop that uh, with like things that sit on the email server or DLP. However, what, happen what can happen with, the, with no code is that you, like a single application, could use two different identities. One identity is your corporate identity and the other is your personal identity. And then things get copied from the, copy from the corporate identity to the personal identity. And the copy, the data itself gets copied on the vendor server. So nothing gets sent on the wire. There's no way for you to catch that through email. These are the, this is just an email being read from one place and then stored in another. So that's like data exfiltration uh, through these no-call platforms is a very common scenario that, you, that uh, you, you, you can see exactly because nothing needs to go on the wire. Like the no-code vendor does all of the, all of the uh, difficult tasks for you. And another thing you can do here is actually move to on-prem, so move to, uh, move to workstations. Because some no-code platforms have also integrated something called RPA, which is basically no-code that runs on somebody's workstation, in a different kind of technology, but it doesn't really matter, where you are able to send commands from the cloud to your workstation to, uh, to perform automation tasks on that workstation. And now, of course, if you can send something from the cloud to a workstation and have that workstation accomplish that task, then if, if, those, uh, if those permissions get shared uh, as well, then you have found a way to move from cloud, from those platforms, directly to people's uh, workstations. And I've actually given a talk at DEF CON last year uh, on how you can basically take, o you could take over that mechanism and then use it as a way to, uh, to, to command and control into, into, into an organization. Uh, this has already been fixed by Microsoft, or at least the vulnerability that I've used there. Um, but this is still a, like a, an, a, an attack vector we need to monitor. And now, up until now, I've, I've kind of shared a few examples here, but let me uh, switch gears here and show you. Um, and so, uh, kind of show you how this looks like. And so, what we're going to do right now is accomplish uh, one of these attacks with a tool called PowerPoint. This is a tool that we've uh, published uh, in uh, Black Hat a few, a few months ago. Um, and it's available right now. You can uh, go to the link uh, on screen. And PowerPoint is a tool that's focused on the Power Platform ecosystem, for my, uh, so Microsoft 365. If, you have, if, you're, uh, if you're a Microsoft shop or if you're doing a penetration testing for a Microsoft shop, this is a, a, ni a nice thing for you to use. And we're going to see a few modules of PowerPoint today. And so the first thing I, I want to show you is, um, is, is those connections and what can you actually accomplish with them. So let me switch off to a quick demo. All right, and hopefully this would be, this will be easy. Okay, so I'm uh, just shooting up uh, PowerPoint here, and you can see that this, there is a simple command on screen, PowerPoint dump, which would actually go and to, uh, I'm providing the tenant that I would like to kind of exfiltrate, um, and then what what would actually happen is that PowerPoint would reach out to the tenant, find all of the uh, connections, applications, credentials that are available to me and then to that user that I've logged in with and then just dump all of the data behind them. So let's see how this looks like. I'm providing the tenant ID for, uh, for PowerPoint. 
it's going to use um, the device login in order to authenticate, but of course you can provide a token from uh, anywhere else. You can also uh, take a, a token to, from other uh, tools like, uh, uh, like road tools or any, any, anything else where you can get a token. Uh, we need a bearer here, but, uh, but you can uh, switch those uh, off. Once you log in, then uh, first of all, it's going to do some recon to find all of the different environments that exist within this specific Power Platform tenant. It's also finding all of the applications and connections that have been shared across an organization. And this is just, again, very easy to do. This, uh, this is going after that pile of gold that we've just described where people have shared connections with, other, with, with, uh, with others. It's going to fetch a few definitions that would allow us to use those connections. And then by the end of the script, um, what happens here is that all of the data behind all of these connections gets, gets dumped to your disk. Uh, so you can see that, uh, uh, like, uh, I'm showing the specific, like, uh, I can, I, you can see that inside of this dump folder uh, for each, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I've listed here all of the different types of connections that I found. So you can see connections to Azure Blob Storage, to uh, Azure File Storage, Azure Tables, uh, CDS, Common Data Services, Power Apps for Admin. So these are di the different connections that I would be able to use. And now, for each one of those types of connections, I can actually look at the uh, at the actual data, and we provide a nice little applet for you uh, with the command Power Platform uh, PowerPoint GUI, which creates this little uh, kind of application. And you can see this is an inventory of everything that we found. We found a bunch of connect a bunch of credentials. So these are the connections that have been overshared. We found a bunch of automations that you can use and applications that you can pick up and use. So if I click on uh, credentials, then you'll see that there's a, a whole bunch of credentials here that I can just pick up and use. Some of them are for, again, Azure File Storage, Azure Blob Storage. You can see where these connections are connected. Uh, in some cases, we're able to actually extract the host name. So you can see, for example, Enterprise uh, IP uh, Blob Storage or Jamie Redding Customer Data uh, or Enterprise Financial. So these are just connections to underlying uh, SQL servers or Azure resources. And you can see a bunch of information about them, like when was this cre credential uh, list, uh, w w if we know of an expiry date, when is it, and, w and when was the connection uh, actually last created. And so when you go into, if, and for each one of those connections, the dump, uh, 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 we actually dump all of the data behind them. So for example, with SQL Server, we, uh, we would list out all of the different tables that are part of the SQL Server. And as you can see, there are three tables here, a customer table and a couple of tables that are kind of default about the you know, uh, firewall tables. And when you go to the customer table, you actually get a full dump of the table. Uh, don't worry, these are not so real social security numbers. This is uh, the uh, chat GPT being helpful. But again, these are like, this is the data behind the connections that we were, o that were was overshared. Um, we can actually do more than that because this is just like this is just showing you that you can um, get to the actual connection to the actual data behind that connection, but you can you can also use those connections to perform operations. So, for example, with SQL Server, we provide you with an automatedly generated uh, Swagger UI, where you can see that there are a whole bunch of actions you can perform on top of this connection. One thing that you can do with the SQL Server is just pass on a SQL query, so you can see that action. Um, So uh, let me move here. All right, so you can see SQL pass through native query, which is the action that would just allow me to run any query that I want on top of this uh, server. I'm just going to use the, the uh, information that I found uh, from the table that you just saw. And I'm going to add a SQL query that's simply going to encrypt uh, some of the social security numbers there uh, on the table. And uh, of course, this is just a demo showing how you can use this access to do some sort of a ransomware attack on top of this uh, of the data that sits behind that connection, and so this specific example is going to uh, to find this f some of the uh, of the customer records and, and and encrypt them, and once I click on execute, this goes through the proxy that we saw earlier and actually uh, would would encrypt the data there. And I'm going to use a get request just to watch the records and, and, sh and make sure that I've 
actually successfully encrypted them. And again, when I click on execute, you'll find that I, I get uh, the information from the tables. This is actually how we perform uh, the dump command. And you can see that the records, that some of the records indeed were encrypted. So the social security numbers indeed were encrypted. So this shows you that you can use this tool to perform operations, any operation that you'd like, on top of these, uh, on top of the underlying uh, uh, services behind that connection. Uh, you can also use this tool to actually just uh, use the applications and the automations that have been uh, shared that, that we got access to. So here are the, all the bunch of applications that we, uh, that we were able to detect. Um, and you can just run each one of them. Uh, so just here is an example. I'm just going to run one of them, and it lets me into the application. We're actually bypassing a couple of mechanisms here, but uh, that's a story for another day. And you can also uh, look at a bunch of automations that are available here, and you can actually trigger those automations. And so the amount of damage that you can do depends on what the automation allows you to do. But in many cases, you'll find automations that allow you, for example, to uh, gain permissions to something or to change access to something. And so hopefully, uh, hopefully this gives you like kind of a taste of what you can do with PowerPoint here. But uh, actually, the number one thing you can do is just play around with it. So please go to that link, and uh, you'll find plenty more uh, documentation. And if you're looking to learn more spe specifically about this issue of, uh, of overshare credentials, I've actually uh, given a talk at Black Hat that is precisely focused on that issue and what happens uh, when guests in your organization, uh, how can they leverage this, uh, um, this, this issue to actually gain access to SQL servers and Azure storage uh, across your organization. Uh, so please do check it out. All right. So we've seen a, a few living, uh, living of the land attacks. One, like the next thing I want to show you is phishing. And before I'll kind of before I'll show you how how you can use no code to do like a active phishing within an organization, uh, let's consider for a second what would be the ideal uh, capability for uh, uh, for an attacker to create a phishing campaign inside of an organization, like a large organization. So you would probably want the application to look and feel like something users are. Uh, are used to, to, to working with, right? It, it should look like something that they're operating with every day. Uh, you would probably want it, to, like if you, if you can, hopefully it's already integrated to their, to their uh, uh, SSO, right? That would be amazing because somebody would just need to click a link and that's it, you, you've owned them because th they don't need to provide their credentials. Um, ideally, it needs to be hosted on somewhere where users will, would trust it, right? Not just a, a random URL, but uh, hopefully like something that they trust. Right? So uh, I'm going to show you right now how you can use the Microsoft platforms to the Microsoft platform to accomplish all of that. Because when you think about, again, the number of applications that we saw earlier, like the huge uh, uh, exponential graph uh, at the beginning of this talk, then you'll like just think about an organization that has created so many of these applications. In an organization that uses these platforms, people are used to, to using a, a, a applications that were generated by these platforms a, a lot, and, and they always look and feel the same thing, the same way. Uh, and so here's the question. Can we, cr can we take an application, can we create an application that's actually useful? It does something useful for an organization. Maybe you'll just pick up an, an application from the marketplace. And then every time a user logs into that application, the user would need to log in, and maybe we can even make, it, make them log in automatically. Once they are in, and they have provided us with uh, uh, like uh, with an authorization to do to basically, for example, access the access email on their behalf to do something that's all right. Then we can use their email to do whatever we want, and then we can own their account. And so, and so this is what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to create an application that is uh, doing something useful, so people will actually use it. But every time somebody logs into it, then uh, then 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 uh, we've owned them. And so. Now I'm going to switch directly to a demo. All right. So 
uh, PowerPoint phishing would allow you, uh, uh, first, what it allows you to do is first, uh, is first of all, it's, it's, it's basically install a phishing application within, within an organization. Of course, you need to be authenticated, right? So you need, you need some user inside of the organization in order to be able to, to create this application. So I'm creating this uh, phishing application, and you can see that the, the name of the application is Shoutout. It's uh, at the end of the command line there. I just picked up a random application from the marketplace and, and just repurposed it. So I'm just going to run the command. Uh, it's going to think for a while, loading a bit, and then it's going to generate uh, an application for me. And you can see, so you can see the application run URL. All right. The most important thing about this URL is that it lives in the Microsoft Tech system, not the domain, apps.powerapps.com. This would be trusted by any enterprise user in any enterprise organization. And more than that, this is already plugged into your uh, Office 365 uh, single sign-on. So this is the link that I need users to, to click. If they click on this link, what happens is that they're just going to they're just gonna uh, go into my app, and so let's let's see how this looks like. All right, so I'm gonna go to the I'm, I'm logging into this application. Uh, the other thing that you saw me do there is share this application. So I need to uh, share it, and specifically here I've shared it with the entire organization, so everybody could use it. All right, so this is loading the application. And once I'm in, this is like a, this is an application from the Microsoft Marketplace. This is a, like a, you can shout out for somebody uh, to give them helpful feedback or po positive feedback for something that they've done. In order to to kind of uh, send out those shout outs, uh, this application requires access to your email. And as you can s and as you've seen at the beginning of, of when when this was loaded, uh, this was kind of provided uh, automatically. And so I'm just gonna use this application. This is just a normal application that somebody can use. And here specifically, I'm going to send a shout out to uh, Alicia, who is a, which is the chief financial officer of my company. Again, I, I, I'm doing that as a normal user in the organization, as like a non user. Once I've, uh, that's, that's the entire experience for me. So I've just used this application. It has, it's, it's probably have done what I, what I wanted it to do. All right, lo logging in as Alicia, you can see that I got a shout out email, which is cool. So this is a, like a cool email that the Microsoft generates for me. And now Alicia would, uh, uh, like she gets this email. So of course, why not? She would uh, log into that application as well because she wants to give shout out to somebody else. Once Alicia is logged in, then she's uh, now another user in, inside of my, my, my application. And so she would continue to send out those emails. And on the hacker side, you can see that like all of the while this while this was happening, both Alicia and the first user that I was logged into was sending their entire email inbox to my own inbox. Was just forwarding their emails, because at the moment they were using the application, I got access to their email. I could do whatever I want with it, and they they have no idea that this is actually happening. And again, if I if I go back a, a bit, you can see the URL here. It's an it's a it's a Microsoft provided domain. All right, so there's plenty more information that we could have gone to uh, with this demo, but if you're looking for more of these examples, there's another talk at Black Hat uh, that was directly related on, on these types of quirks, so if you're interested, just uh, check it out. Okay, we have uh, time for one more, and it's gonna be, um, I, I might kind of uh, skip uh, some of it, but one of the things that so you you understand how powerful uh, like getting being an attacker and being able to access those platforms you understand how powerful it is so of course attackers would want a way to stay in once they're in uh, and so what i'm going to show you right now is a way for an attacker to create a backdoor into an organization once they so they have access to a user and they would like to maintain that access and they will be able to maintain that access even if the user they initially used gets gets deleted the resources still remain, they can still use the, the backdoor that they have created. 
this is actually not something that we uh, like. This was this was actually observed uh, being done by by an APT group uh, a few years now, uh, a few years back. And you can see a, a, a few some information about this here. But essentially, what they did, what they've done, is that they were able to compromise an admin account, and they, they, then they set up an information which. Um, on recurrence, use the uh, uh, office features to search around office for PII and secrets, and just send it to the random endpoint, and, and nobody was was looking at, at at that place for for a while. So if you're interested in that, just like uh, check out this blog. Um, so I'm gonna let me switch. Let me uh, kind of quickly jump in here because I I think we can go directly to show you what is actually happening. So. Here's what the attackers have done. They have created, a, a, to my point, an application that runs on recurrence that would kind of do something that's malicious on their behalf. What you can actually do, if you take this a step further, is you can create an application. All right. You can create a, an application that does uh, three things. One is that an automation does three things. So it would, instead of accepting like a specific payload, like something to do, like, a, like instead of doing something like the attackers have done in this APT group where they have uh, exfiltrated the information outside of the organization, you can accept the definition to build a new automation. So that's the create flow uh, operation. And then you can uh, run that automation, and then you can delete that automation together with all of its logs. And so this is essentially an automation that is a factory to create other automations. And this is what we've done here. And again, I'm going to show you with uh, a, a, like a, I'm not sure we have time, but um, what what essentially we were able to do here is when you, is w w you create, you know what? Uh, I'm going to, I'm just going to show you. So, <laughs> and sorry, I'm uh, a bit hard to, uh, a bit difficult to read, to read the audience. Um, and so let me show you exactly how this looks like with PowerPoint. All right. So I'm creating, I'm running a PowerPoint backdoor. Again, this is, a, this is the first command. This needs to be authenticated. The first command is installing the factory. That factory would, would be our backdoor. Um, and you can see that I'm, I'm kind of providing uh, some information here. That the right now is just creating an automation that would accept definitions of other automations that we'd like to create. Once I'm done with creating this automation, I get, uh, you can see that the flow was successfully installed. And now I get a webhook URL. That webhook URL is, is my back door, all right? And you can spot on that, on that URL that there is actually a secret there at the end of that uh, URL. This is the URL that is going to, this is the mechanism that's going to allow us to continue to hit that backdoor endpoint, even though a user gets deleted. Now you can use a PowerPoint backdoor to use that backdoor. And you can see that through that backdoor, you can do a couple of things. You can create an automation, create a flow. You can delete that flow to remove uh, uh, every kind of, uh, every track behind you. And you can also get connections which would allow you to see what that flow would be able to use, like pick up and use things that were created after you've already left the organization. So in this example, first of all, uh, I've used, this is the user that I've used in order to, to create this application. What I'm going to do is disable that user. So once I disable that user, you would think that I would lose access to everything that this, uh, that this user has created, but you'd be wrong because those automations would still be, would still, would still operate. So let's see that in action. Now I can use that backdoor to get connections that allows me to, uh, to see all of the different uh, credentials that are available for me to use. I'm using that through the, the uh, webhook URL that I received earlier, my backdoor. And you can see that it is uh, run successfully even though the user that has created this automation has been disabled. I get this list of connections. And in this list of connections, I'm going to find uh, an Azure file storage. And I want, the, I want to be able to connect uh, an, an, an Azure, uh, Azure queue. And I want to be, be able to connect to that Azure queue. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use that endpoint to create an automation. Again, the backdoor would create an automation for me. 
At that automation, once I run a PowerPoint, that automation is going to use the connection to that Azure queue to create a SAS token that would allow me to read that queue. And so what I'm actually doing here is just exfiltrating out, uh, outside of Power Platform the, the credential to that, uh, to, the, to that queue. So you can see that I've successfully created a new automation through my backdoor automation. I got a new webhook URL which would allow me to run this new automation. I'm just, now I'm just gonna use curl to, to, go, to hit that endpoint, which would actually trigger the automation and provide me with information behind it. So, and, and what I've actually uh, created in this, so this specific automation that I've created just returns the SAS token that allows me to, again, to read that queue. So I've just exfiltrated outside the connection there. And now I want to make sure that nobody would ever find me so in order to do that, uh, all I need to do is, is, use, is use PowerPoint backdoor delete flow, which would delete the automation that I've created, thus deleting the logs that are uh, part of the, the same object. And so this backdoor allows you to, this, is, this was one example of an automation that I was able to create through, to create, run, and delete through this endpoint, this backdoor endpoint. But I could have done this with any other automation like, uh, your, your, your imagination is the only limit. All right, so I'm kind of, uh, we're, we're kind of at the end. So I want to make sure that I give you enough, uh, I want to make sure that I, that I leave you uh, like in a better place than, 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 you've, than you've started. So um, I'm going to share a few concrete uh, things that you can do tomorrow morning to help secure your organization. Um, and with each of them, I'm just gonna kind of uh, describe it, but you'll see a link below in a moment, which would give you all of the relevant information, uh, like including configuration and everything else that is required. So, and this is gonna be just like pretty simple. The first thing is, of course, you need to build secure applications, right? And one thing that's pretty obvious is that uh, you don't want to share connections that are essentially your identity with other users within your organization you especially don't want to share it with everyone, which would include everyone in your tenant. And so that's uh, just kind of one best practice. But actually, there are a bunch of things that, uh, that business users can do or that professional developers can do when they build these low-code, no-code applications that end up with uh, producing, creating vulnerabilities that could be exploited by an, by an attacker. And because of the scale of, the, of these applications, the number of applications that gets created, um, it would be very difficult. So it would be it, like you could very easily gamble that, uh, that an organization uh, would probably have at least one of these vulnerabilities in, in their environment. And so there's a special, there's an, a dedicated OWASP uh, top 10 list. Uh, that, that's a project that, uh, uh, that uh, I'm guessing a, few, a couple of people in the room have contributed to, uh, which is focused on what the, uh, the problems that occur with these types of applications. And we are focused on the kind of on logical problems, on things that just does, don't make sense when you build, when, when, uh, you, when you allow everyone to, to build applications. So please do uh, check that out. We also have a talk tomorrow in the, uh, in the uh, project, uh, uh, in the, uh, for project sessions, uh, in the project so showcase. So uh, please reach out to us uh, tomorrow as well. The other thing I recommend you do is harden your environment. And I think the, like if you take one thing from this talk, um, we can't expect to have so many developers using low-code, no-code, um, and to invest so little security effort into helping them do their job and not have a bunch of vulnerabilities out there and not be owned by hackers. We really need to step up application security uh, for local no code applications and the things that citizen developers are, are building. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, but there's plenty more to, to say about that. So uh, please check out the link. And the last thing I'll say is a hacker environment uh, because other people are trying. And uh, if you're looking for a resource, please check out PowerPoint. Uh, everything I've, I've, I've everything you've seen today and other things can be accomplished uh, and it's all open source. Um, with that, thank you very much.